Hello, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube. I am Clementine, and as always, I am Super Saiyan. But never mind that. In this video, we're going to take some ancient Russian germanium transistors and a bunch of other bibs, bobs, and doobly doos. Look at a few schematics and get out of breadboard. Test and tweak that baby until we create the bastard love child between a fuzz face and a Dallas Range Master. Then we'll transfer this circuit over to a piece of Vero, wire it all up in a neat little black box with some white chicken heads for retro cool hipstery style points of course. And we'll throw it on a mic'd up tube amp in front of a couple of drive pedals and explore a plethora of sounds. I will show and explain this entire process in detail, and by that I do mean this entire process and in complete detail. So it's probably gonna be a long one with a lot of nerdery in it. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, grab you a snack and a beverage and stay tuned. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Okay, so I got one of those stage right uh, 15 watt tube amps with the push pull EL84s in it. This works really good with pedals. So I started uh, trying different gain stacking orders and stuff, and I actually found that using the uh, Klon as a boost and a tube screamer as an overdrive, like I have been doing for a while, wasn't nearly as good as using the tube screamer as a boost and the Klon as an overdrive. But I'm missing some sounds that I want. I need a pedal in front of that tube screamer. Something with a lot of output so that it can push those other pedals. If it got dirty, that'd be great. And if it would clean up with the volume knob, like a fuzz face does, that would be even better. The ability to get velcro -y and gaity in front of those two overdrives could also be quite useful. I have built a circuit in the past that did something very similar to what I need. Very clean, very clean and usable sound. Just tiny bit of breakup but it was still a little bit too rowdy when it was uh, running full out. But then here's the other side of the spectrum. Basically what I need is like a fuzz face light. And I think I have just the answer. When PD2 Finger built me this white Clark Gainster, this is a really awesome pedal, all new old stock uh, mojo parts. Great always on, end of the chain kind of deal. But anyway, when he sent it to me, he also sent me quite a bit of parts, including the Soviet era military germanium transistors. <laughs> Definitely what one would call mojo parts. But he tested these on a little rig he's got and found them to be too low of an HFE or not enough gain for what he was using them for, but they should be perfect for what I need. If you're interested in testing germanium transistors, I'll put a link to this video in the description. I myself kind of have the lazy hack mentality, so I'll show you how I test transistors. First thing I need is the breadboard, but it currently has a silicon tube hybrid overdrive circuit on it that I was working on. So I'll start depopulating it and putting all the stuff in the bags and I realized I really gotta do some organization with all my components. So I dumped everything out on the floor and I took me a little cabinet with drawers in it and I labeled them all and I put everything in the appropriate places. Now this whole thing and every other build in the future should be a whole lot easier. First thing I did was to connect a 9 volt power supply to this little breadboard. I do have the jack soldered to the edge rails under the bottom for convenience. Then I throw in a red LED and a resistor so that I know that if the sound stops I still have power and if that LED goes dim I know that I'm shorting something. Before I start breadboarding I'm going to take me a couple of 100k B pots or linear taper pot and I'm soldering one leg to the wiper by looping a single wire through both holes and then on the other one it's just a single. These will act as uh, trimmers to bias the transistors or spoiler alert unbiased the transistors for desired effect. Then I wired up a 500k audio taper pot to act as a volume pot. You don't have to have a big CTS pot like this, it's just what I happen to have because I use these in guitars. To create an easy input and output for the breadboard, I use this uh, conduit box that I put some jacks in a long time ago. Shove these wires in the board and we're good to go. Now I'm going to show you my lazy hack way to test these transistors. This is RG Keen's simple PNP fuzz face circuit. There's an NPN and PNP rabbit hole here, but what We'll go down it later on in the video. If you take this fuzz face circuit and cut out the whole second gain stage, 
Then you just connect the output section straight to the collector on that first transistor where the second transistor was previously connected. Then for simplicity, I'll delete the volume knob and attach the output straight to the coupling capacitor. And for adjustments, you can replace the bias resistor with a 100K trimmer pot or regular linear potentiometer. And now you got a dirt simple little PNP. An amplifier circuit works as a great little germanium boost. But with such a low parts count, you'll really be able to hear what a transistor sounds like and how much gain it has when you switch them in and out of here. Okay, so I have the first half, the first gain stage of this fuzz face built. But I'm using these super high HFE germaniums that came out of an old tape player. to say I don't feel like the HFE on this is too terribly low you start to turn up the volume So this little circuit is rocking and when you turn up the volume on the guitar it gets real dirty but the thing is it's not really getting dirty it's just putting out a whole lot of output and the front end of that little solid state bench amp is what's actually creating most of that distortion so we need a second transistor stage i tried building the fuzz face and it just wasn't giving me what i need even with the ability to adjust the bias, like the trimmer pots in that low HFE Joe Bonamassa signature fuzz face, it was just not the sound I was looking for. Way too much hair, not enough output. I even tried the fuzz circuit I showed earlier in the video. It was just not what I need. Then it hit me. I just need another amplifier for this thing to hit. So I thought common emitter amplifier range master, Dallas range master. I built one a couple years ago, germanium one and gave it to a friend as a Christmas present. He runs pedals in to it all the time and it takes pedals like a champ so pin apple apple pin i just throw the two circuits together and with the sound i got i knew i would be just a few tweaks away from what i really need <laughs> So I tweakulated on this circuit, changing around component values, I added another bias pot, removed a capacitor, and this is the final schematic that I landed on here. The Clementine Fuzz Ranger. Now if you look over by the output, that may look like a redundant volume knob. It's a volume knob going into a volume knob. But I guess since the other one is part of the bias circuit, it really does make a difference. And after I did this, I thought, man, that's not right. But it sounds right, so I'm going to leave it. And I ended up looking at some schematics later on. Mossrat's got a pot 
going off of a pot so it must be in good company this is a very versatile configuration this achieved exactly what i needed for in front of those two overdrive pedals well i think this is my final design i took away one of these 68 nanofarad capacitors out here i added a uh another bias for this second transistor got my master volume here now you can do all kinds of things <laughs> Oh, it'll still clean up. Clean up and get as loud as you want it. But you can make it Velcro, Velcro crazy ass fuzz. Let's see how Velcro we can get here. Fuzz. Oh yeah. Okay, if you sat through all of that, congratulations and thank you. You're ready to move on to the next section. That's almost like a karate kid wax on wax off kind of situation there. If you ain't got the patience to sit through that, then circuit design and pedal building just may not be for you. Music is Wind did a guitar myth uh, video a few years back where he said, how can you identify any tonal differences in gear when you're just playing the same five crappy blues licks over and over again? Well, it's obvious to me you don't design and build any gear. When you're tweaking and breadboarding a circuit, you're going to do a whole lot of this. Watch any of Brian Wampler's uh, breadboarding or pedal design videos. You'll see he does the same two riffs over and over again while he's changing parts and sculpting a sound. And by doing this, he has effectively created a pedal empire. Another thing I've noticed is that people act like uh, designing, building, and winding guitar pickups is like wizardry. Compared to designing and building even simple pedal circuits, it's very easy. That's like building an amp. Whether you design and build your circuit from scratch, or you're building a clone of an existing amplifier, you usually have a lot more room to work in. Putting that same amount of wiring and circuitry into a tiny little box can at times be one of the most trying and frustrating things you've ever done in your life. Man, fuck this shit, man. Now I'm not saying all this to put anybody off of this hobby or to seem like I'm cool. You can definitely learn how to do this and you can definitely build pedals even when you don't know what you're doing. I'm just saying this is more of the calm, patient man's game here. And I have extreme respect for people who have designed a lot of pedals like Brian or people like Petey who have built enough pedals to level out a truck bed. I'm sure they have both dealt with extreme <laughs> levels of frustration over the years. But then, when you can plug those pretty little boxes up and make awesome sounds out of it, it's very rewarding. Especially when you can build a circuit that you couldn't buy, 
or when you can scavenge or get good deals on mojo parts and build stuff you normally couldn't afford. Okay, enough of that. Let's start putting this circuit onto some Vero board. I'm sure there's some proper way that you're supposed to lay out a circuit on pad per hole Vero board, but I just start on the left of the schematic and work to the right, same way I do on the breadboard. Right here what I'm doing is putting in the input wire. Input and indigo both start with I, so I use a blue wire or an indigo wire so that I can easily remember that. And I'm coming in with a coupling capacitor. I like pad per hole Vero for this reason. I can just kind of stick stuff anywhere I want to and connect it any way I want to. What you see Petey holding right here, this is a strip board Vero. This requires a much more methodical and thought out approach, but it is a more precise way to duplicate a very complicated circuit. Now I'll put this in the helping hands and start to solder it up. And you'll notice as I go along that one thing I do that is kind of like strip board is uh, even though pad per hole lets you put leads anywhere you want to and you can run jumper wires all over the place and solder in any direction I tend to do my solder points and uh, intersections in straight lines that's just a personal thing it tends to help me keep everything in a more orderly fashion so here's a good close-up of me tacking in the 9 volt positive wire but I have a long piece of it stretched out to act as a ground bus and you may think 9 volt positive is ground Yes, that's part of that NPN and PNP rabbit hole I talked about earlier, and we will get to that later in the video. So what I'm tacking this uh, wire to there in the middle of the circuit is one of the legs of a three pin header socket that is taped to the bottom side of the board so that I'll be able to switch the transistors. Down the road if I see fit, and if I put one in backwards, I can just flip it around without having to solder or desolder anything. And now I'm gonna solder on that first bias adjustment pot that I've plucked from the breadboard in the background what we got now is that first gain stage from the fuzz face I originally built to test the transistors. Before I start to build the range master section of the circuit, I need to solder up a 10K pot. This is a kind of tarnished uh, pot out of my old stash of parts that I thought I'd use up. That was a bad idea, but you'll learn more about that later. So here's a good close-up view of the circuit after I've started on the second gain stage. That piece of tape was used to hold the second transistor socket in place until I could get it tacked in. And you can see here a better view of how I was saying I like to make all my connections and solder points in straight lines. Once again, this is not at all necessary. This just uh, helps me keep things more neatly placed and less confusing. So I continue to grab parts and place them on the circuit board using both the schematic and breadboard as references. And here we go in for an extreme close-up. Now look at that soldering on the left there. That's kind of ugly looking, right? Well, that's because this is my own project and I kind of always do that. I'm, I'm rushing through this trying to get it done. I've never found that it really matters. Plus, this stuff is hard enough to do. And try to keep this circuit straight in your mind and not get confused without having to deal with lighting, camera angle, focus, all these things that come along with YouTube. So I'm gonna do one really good solder joint here up close where you can see it. The key, really, is to just kinda go real slow, take your time, feed plenty of solder in there, work the iron up a little bit, feed plenty more in, work it up just a little bit more, feed plenty more in. Flux also can help quite a bit if you wanna get glassy, perfect robot soldering like Petey does. So now I'm soldering in the master volume knob and a couple jumpers, and this simple circuit is basically done, but I got to looking at it, and I had two junctions that weren't exactly bridged, but they were a little bit too close for comfort. So once again, I'm going more for a function than looks, so I decided to go ahead and run the iron through there, pull it through there a couple of times to make sure those were good and separated. And here's our finished circuit board. With all the jacks and the input and output, power wires all connected to it, we got no apparent solder bridges, and I got the feeling this thing's gonna work like a champ. But before I even stick any transistors in there, even think about putting power to it, I'm gonna show you a good little trick that I picked up from Petey. You see here how he's blowing out on this circuit board? That's what does it, it fixes everything. No, no, really, he's blowing on this because it's to dry out the strong isopropyl alcohol. Stronger you can get, the better. Take a toothbrush, dip it in there, scrub down the back of the entire circuit. Do it twice, it's even better. This removes the flux from all the solder joints. Flux is actually conductive. So even if you don't actually use flux paste like a Pity and I do, that rosin core solder you're using 
That rosin is flux and it can wreak all kind of havoc. So if you'll just scrub it down, let it dry completely before you ever put power to it. Those dead on startup and uh, crazy oscillation and squealing, intermediate function, electrical gremlins, they'll be cut down to virtual zero. As a testament to that, I popped some transistors in it, hooked it up to the breadboard, it passed audio perfectly. Sorry no sound on this clip, I had to use headphones, my wife was asleep and she goes to work before daylight. So then I tried it independent of the breadboard running off a nine volt battery. And as these circuits uh, often do, sounded much better, much quieter, much better biasing. So now it's time to start figuring out how we're gonna box this thing up. So luckily I had this 1590 BB size pedal enclosure that I had ordered several of many, many moons ago for just such an occasion as this. I grabbed the circuit and started trying to cram it in there and seeing how it could fit. And I figured out that if I folded the three top knobs over behind the circuit, that would give me just enough room for the big old CTS master volume pot, a foot switch and a nine volt battery. And the input and output jacks have perfect little holes to fit in on each side here. I have to make room for that nine volt battery because I'm not using external power supply. And this is because of MPN and PNP rabbit hole I spoke of earlier. So why don't we go ahead and go down it now as good as time as any. On the left, you see this germanium transistor. It's got a little metal top hat on it. And on the right, there's a smaller black transistor. This is a silicon transistor. Basically all modern circuits are built with silicon transistors or op-amp chip packages that contain silicon transistors. And generally the majority of those are NPN. This stands for negative, positive, negative. And this just refers to the doping layers or chemical layers in the crystal that the transistor is made out of. So that like hippie kind of friend that you got that talks about the powers in crystals and amplification in crystals. Hey, there's kind of something to that. Every solid state device you've ever used in your life, including whatever you're watching this on, it works from crystals. Well, either way, modern silicon amplification circuits use the negative side of the power as ground. And in the early stages of transistor making, when they were still using these old germaniums, apparently it was a lot easier to make those PNP, positive, negative, positive. So the majority of those are PNP. And this means it actually uses the positive side of the battery as the ground. So if you want to take a PNP fuzz face circuit like this and turn it to an MPN silicon fuzz face, you simply have to flip the polarity of the battery and make sure that all your grounds tie to the negative side. So therefore, unless you use an extra bit of circuitry known as a charge pump on your germanium pedals, daisy chaining them with non-germanium pedals and also using a daisy chain power supply will create a dead short. Then none of it will work and you may let the magic smoke out. And this whole deal is further confusing and complicated by the fact that the boss standard power supplies that pedals use are center negative. And people refer to this sometimes as positive ground, but it's actually not. Your pedal enclosure and the sleeve part of your instrument cables are still negative. It's just that the wiring on the barrel plug of the adapter has been switched. So now you know why I needed a big old box with a space for that battery and also chicken heads are pretty big. So to lay all this stuff out and make sure I get it on there in a nice perfect grid pattern so the front of my pedal doesn't look like tomater. I measure the width of the enclosure with a set of digital dial calipers. Then I exactly half that size, put some marks on the enclosure and then use the battery package as a straight edge and mark me a center line. So then I half that measurement, made marks again, delineating a center line between the center line. And I used a straight edge to mark those again. And then to make sure they had plenty of space for those chicken head knobs not to interfere with one another, I marked uh, three millimeters to the outside edge of each one of those marks and drew another set of lines. I then grabbed the foot switch first and then second the largest volume pot to figure out what a good center line from the edge would be on the Y axis up and down. Mark those uh, lines out with a straight edge and now we got a good grid. Lay everything up on there and you see nothing interferes with each other. Nothing sticks off the edge. The layout of the front of this enclosure is completed. And to get the layouts for my input and output jacks, I just basically lined up the straight edge from corner to corner and created an X, which would show me my center point. I did the same thing on the other side and jotted out an appropriate size for the drill bit that I would need. Now I got the real pointy step drill in the drill press and I'm ready to start drilling pilot holes. I tried to hold this in a way that the drilling of the enclosure would be in full view, but it tried to slip out and walk on me. 
So I had to put my hand in the way. So you can see here, once I got all the pilots on the front, I thought I'd go ahead and start the actual drilling with the camera at a different angle to, for a good close up. Quickly found this wasn't gonna work either. So I switched to a bigger step drill and got another angle on the far side of the drill press. And I'm telling you guys, sometimes recording this stuff is hard, trying to be your own cameraman and make sure you get the shot while you're trying to make sure that you don't ruin the piece you're working on. It's tough. Now you can see I brought a pot with me so that I can make sure I get the holes exactly right. On this next hole, I forgot completely to try to get my arm out of the way. Same thing with the next one, but that turned out pretty good. Then I actually remembered I tried to move my elbow up out of the way, but you see, to drill, I have to come down and block the shot. And obviously I did the hole for the foot switch again and make sure it was big enough. So here's what all the holes look like. They're not perfect, but they're plenty close enough. And this time I was mindful to put the camera on the left side and then flip the box around so you could see the inside of the box while I come down with the step drill and it can be seen coming through the other side of the box on the inside. I guess it's kind of strange that I'd be talking about camera angles and stuff this whole time, but what else am I gonna say? Oh, drill slow, use this special kind of drill. No, I just poked holes in it. Do the same, don't make them too big. You, you can make a littler one bigger, but you can't make a bigger one littler, but even then you have washers. So now it's time to put this Medusa looking massive wires and circuitry into the box or drilled enclosure if you're being fancy. But first I've got to nip these little locating tabs off of these two bias pots so that they can sit flush against the face of the enclosure. The reason for these little tabs is to act as a locating pin, but in this strong uh, aluminum enclosure, I can just tighten them down real tight and they're not going nowhere. Also I thought I'd go ahead and throw a plastic cap on the back of this uh, old tarnish pot I got out of my junk parts pile. It ended up being unnecessary in the end as you'll see in just a little while so now to put the pots through the holes and start shoving that circuit off in there and it may be apparent to you now what those little plastic caps are for they keep the middle back plate of the potentiometers from shorting out the bottom side of the circuit board so I went ahead and started putting the uh, washers and nuts on all the potentiometers to see how everything would fit inside the enclosure. I temporarily installed the back plate to make sure that it didn't encounter any interference from any wiring or the circuit board. And I loosely dropped the knobs on there to get a good look at what we're working with. And even though that this is a rather large pedal enclosure, I'm gonna do as much soldering as I can on the outside of this box. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this 2D TP, or however you say that, the, the foot switch. I'm gonna pull the foot switch out of here. What I'm doing here is installing a jumper wire that will connect the two sides of this switch when it is depressed. The reason I'm using this simple six leg double pole double throw switch DPDT, <laughs> I can never get that right. Instead of the more common nine pin triple pole double throw, here's a schematic of both of those, is because I'm not using an LED because I want the battery to last a long time. Germaniums don't hardly pull any power at all. As well as I am gonna turn the power on and off another way. And this is how that's going to be done. I am soldering the positive leg of the battery terminal to the ring terminal of a TRS stereo input jack. When you plug a regular mono cable into here, it's gonna make a connection through the sleeve and turn the circuit on. And since this is gonna be the first pedal in my chain on the pedal board, that's great. When I get done playing, I just unplug the guitar cable and it'll go off and save the battery. And here I'm connecting the to the ring terminal of the jack to make sure that happens. And I know this seems weird, 9 volt positive to the ground terminal. Once again, that's because this is PNP ger germanium. If it was a silicon NPN, we would be doing all this switching with the negative ground wire. And here I'm soldering the input wire of the circuit board to the foot switch. And now I'm going from the other side of the foot switch to the tip terminal of the input jack so that we can get guitar signal into the pedal and then select which direction it's gonna go like a train on a track. Now I can go ahead and install that foot switch and input jack as all the wiring on the input circuit is completed. Here I'm splicing the negative power leads together and really some good thinking and planning could have avoided me having to splice two wires together. And I knew this, but I really wanted to test this circuit before I ever tried to put it in this box for troubleshooting reasons. And once again, this is for me and not for somebody else. It doesn't bother me at all. I put some heat shrink on there, shrink it up with the iron. It'll be fine forever. And now we're almost done. Here I'm connecting the signal wire from the foot switch to the output jack. And you might see there's only one wire connected to that output jack. I am electing not to connect a ground wire to that jack because when you 
plug an instrument cable into the input jack, those ring and sleeve terminals connect and it sends ground through this entire box. That creates a Faraday cage around the circuit, quieting the whole thing down. And unless the jacks become corroded or tarnished, I shouldn't really need a ground wire for that output jack. The whole enclosure is my ground wire. So now we can throw a battery in it and it's ready to test. And the first test seems like a complete success. It's quiet. It's great with battery power, but after I spend some time with it, I notice I should have known better than to use that old tarnished goddamn potentiometer. So now we gotta take the back off, rip the damn thing apart, and then try to fish that knob up through the hole and out of the top. Now you'll notice on this and much of my other work, like pretty much any amps or pedals I build, I twist my leads. Now this helps couple the wires and it acts more like a shielded cable and it makes quieter operation. But this also makes you be able to twist or untwist your leads for lengthening and shortening. And that really saved my ass in this situation. I was able to clip that pot off and get enough lead out the end there to cleanly solder up this pretty shiny new pot, which I should have used in the first place. And you best believe that this time I'm gonna test this m mother of all things good before I put it back together. Excellente, we may proceed. So I was able to twist the leads back up, fish that little pot in there, get the washer and the nut on there, tighten it up with my little dog bone thing. Then I was able to scoot the circuit board over a little bit more to the right and a little bit more up and I actually got a cleaner install after all. So let's just act like I meant to do that and then I will wipe off some of the extra cutting fluid that got on here from the drill press, turn all the pots to maximum and start lining up and tightening down these chicken heads. And that's one thing I do love about this type of uh, knobs. They have a little hex key in them that'll tighten up onto just about any kind of shaft. You see I have different kinds of shafts here. I'm using three different type and three different size shafts and knurled and smooth potentiometers. And these knobs will go down to all of them and lock right on. Once they're all on there and locked down, you would never know that I was using two small alphas, one small WL and one large size CTS all on the same pedal. So real quick, before I button it up and throw the back on there, I'll put a big old sticker on there for two reasons. One, I wanna be able to write what this is, who made it, when I made it, and you might notice it's probably a good while from when you're watching right now. Saying that the making and recording of this video took a long time is quite a bit of an understatement. <laughs> but either way, this will act as an insulator for the back plate so that the circuit doesn't ground out on the inside of the pedal enclosure. I open up that pack and put a brand new battery in here. And if you look at that circuit, you can see that another thing I did to keep anything from touching something it wasn't supposed to is I pushed those uh, two transistors over to give them some headroom. Now if you remember those things are socketed, I could pull them out, put other ones in. I thought I would be auditioning a bunch of transistors in this video, but the first ones that I picked up and plugged into each position were just perfect for what I needed. And one may say the reason for that is that I did build the circuit around those transistors. But either way, we're ready to throw the back on here, put the screws in it, and she's done. I proceeded to throw this baby on top of the amp solo and play it for about two hours to make sure if it was gonna break, it's gonna do it now while I still got everything out. At this point, I had it cranked up about four times louder than it should be for the camera mic, so all it really picked up was a bunch of booming, but here's an example of some of the sounds I was getting. I figured out it really was doing everything I set out to do and everything I wanted to do. And the most important part is that I wasn't going to catch on fire or catch anything else on fire. I went ahead and chained it up with some pedals, threw a mic in front of the amp, and I turned it down to what I thought was a more respectable level, but after blasting my ears out for two hours, I guess I was basically deaf. And I hit the close mic so hard that all it was was a bunch of fizz, so unfortunately I will not be using the close mic track. 
but luckily I did have an aftermarket mic attached to the camera. It recorded decently except for the times when it was way too loud and it peaked just a little bit, but I do believe you're gonna be able to get a very good idea about what this pedal sounds like and how it interacts with these other pedals as well as the amplifier. Also, this video has already been way too long to have anybody with a short attention span still sticking around, so I'm just gonna throw the whole jam on there because I'm also tired of editing. I'm sure you will be hearing this amp and pedal combination many more times in the future of this channel and under a very much better recording situations, but as for now, I recorded quite a bit of it. And I encourage you to skip through it or whatever if you're not patient enough to listen to the whole thing. There are a whole lot of different tones in here. This thing was exceedingly capable. So without further ado, let's get it on!
that just about does it for this video i don't think i've ever in my life put in as much work and time into any video as this one if you found this educational or entertaining in any way please like and maybe subscribe i am clementine you've been watching heavy metal atc see you next time